together with Dennis Cara, we present to you God's Truth on Sunday mornings. We're glad you're with us today. It's also available on Facebook under the Little Rock Church of Christ and YouTube under Proverbs Live. We'd invite you to worship with us at the Little Rock Church of Christ, which sponsors the program at uh, Rodney Parham and 430. Uh, we meet there at uh, 1030 and then again Sunday at 5. Uh, we meet again Wednesday at 7. We're properly socially distanced and wearing masks, but we're worshiping and singing and studying God's Word together, and we'd love to have you with us. We've begun a study of the scientific evidence that supports our faith in the fact that God is the creator of this world. And the evidence is much stronger than the naturalistic explanations proposed and taught in our textbooks as propaganda. Uh, particularly, we've been talking about the fossil record. We had three lessons on that, and they're archived there on their Facebook and uh, YouTube. If you want to go back and look at those lessons, I think looking at that, you can see the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of creation, that the fossil record is much better explained as a flood deposit, a rapid catastrophic event, rather than millions of years of evolution. The second stanza of that song, with the same kinds of problems, uh, will be seen as we now look at fossil men. Uh, it, it, it's really not different we see a much better explanation than what we see in the textbooks. But a lot of people only get to see the propaganda. A uh, very interesting fact was brought to our attention by Dr. Jerry Bergman, who is a creation scientist. Uh, he is a professor at Northwest uh, College uh, of Ohio and has been for 25 years. Uh, he's a doctorate in biology, uh, He's taught biochemistry, biology, chemistry, physics, genetics, anthropology, geology, and micropology over those 25 years. Uh, published over 200 technical articles, over 20 books, very accomplished and qualified scientist. But he helped do a survey, a poll of those who had been converted to believe in evolution and was asking why, what evidence persuaded them he said 81% said that the evidence that persuaded them was that from fossil man. Well, we need to consider that evidence. This is what's having a powerful influence. I don't think we need to just tell people not to believe. We need to look at the evidence and have enough integrity to follow the evidence wherever it goes. The evidence for fossil man, I think, is very much against evolution. But let's look at the facts and see if that, is, uh, that conclusion is supported. And beginning with uh, a quibble that we hear quite often, that really Darwin never said we came from apes. I, evidently they're a little bit sensitive to the implications of that kind of a statement. Uh, Bill Allen, who was editor of National Geographic several years ago, said uh, humans are not descended from apes. Uh, then Charles Darwin never claimed that we are. I am amazed that here at the editorial of National Geographic such a blatantly false statement uh, is put forth. And then more recently, uh, Van Ive, who is a historian of science, University of Cambridge, ought to know better. He says, Darwin said we came from monkeys. Nope, he never said that. This common misconception belies a profound misunderstanding of evolution. Well, do we misunderstand? <laughs> or is this exactly what Darwin said? Let's just look at Darwin's book, The Descent of Man. Here he says, a naturalist undoubtedly would have ranked as an ape or a monkey. However much the conclusion may revolt our pride, that our early progenitors would have been properly designated. Ape or monkey, that's not hard to comprehend. That would be the proper designation of our early progenitors, our ancestors, according to Darwin. Later on in the same book, he says, disseminate, uh, 
category that would include the apes branched off into two great stems, the New World and the Old World monkeys, and from the latter, that is Old World monkeys, man. Now, we didn't come from New World monkeys. We came from Old World monkeys. Very plainly, Darwin said that, and here's uh, National Geographic and uh, Cambridge and Eugenia Scott and uh, leaders just trying to ease the, the pain, <laughs> maybe the implications, we came from apes. No, yes, that's what they say plainly. Uh, here, uh, Ernst Hutton, uh, who was head of the anthropology department at Harvard in his book, Up From the Apes, I think that pretty well tells the story, but he says, if we are descended from apes, our remote ancestors ought to look their part. You may not be willing to admit that you resemble an ape, and evidently some of these later scholars is, uh, kind of squirm at that point, but as you trace back the genealogical lines, you'll have to admit somewhere in your family tree there squats an ape. Uh, and so don't let them get by with saying, no, we don't really believe that. That's exactly what is the case. But is there evidence for that? That's, of course, the real critical point. As we looked at the evidence from the fossil record earlier, we pointed out from John Horner that the nature of this evidence does not provide scientific proof. It is historical evidence. Now, John Horner is the real life paleontologist that uh, Jurassic Park presented as Alan uh, Grant, you recall. This is the real one. He says paleontology is a historical science, a science based on circumstantial evidence. After the fact, we can never reach hard and fast conclusions. History is something you can't repeat and therefore it's not subject to scientific proof. These days it's easy, he says, to go through school a good many years, sometimes even through college, without ever hearing that some sciences are historical or by nature inconclusive. Now, that's the best that you can get from the evidence, but even that uh, I think is very negative to the concept of evolution. And we might consider how much evidence is involved. It's historical not that which can be repeated uh, and uh, performed uh, with experiments, but there's not much even of the historical evidence. Richard Leakey, one of the more famous paleoanthropologists, uh, says in his book, The Making of Mankind, unfortunately the fossil record is, some, uh, is somewhat incomplete as far as hominids are concerned. Uh, in other words, we don't have evidence where we need it. It's all but blank for the apes. Uh, what leads up to the apes? Uh, we got no record at all. Well, of course, that's what the creationist would predict. Jeffrey Schwartz, more recently, he's professor of biological anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh, very famous paleoanthropologist, says we're still in the dark about the origin of most of the major groups of organisms. They appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zenus, full-blown, raring to go, in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution. Now he addresses the point directly that is what Darwin said should be, and no, it's not. Boom, there they are, full-blown. Uh, Donald Johansson, famous discoverer of Lucy, uh, very famous fossil uh, man, so supposedly, that we'll look at later. He says, at any rate, modern gorillas, orangs, chimpanzees spring out of nowhere, as it were. They are here today. They have no yesterday. And so as far as the evidence leading up to the apes, which are then supposed to lead to man, uh, the leading authorities say they, uh, the record is blank, they appear full-blown, they spring out of nowhere, and of course that's what you have read in the textbooks about the record. <laughs> they kind of leave that part out. Uh, and, but how much is there for the fossil man, from ape to man? Uh, well, notice the statement by David Pilbeam, one of the leaders in anthropology from Harvard. He comments warily, if you brought in a smart scientist from another discipline and showed him the meager evidence we've got, he'd surely say, forget it, there isn't enough to go on. 
there's just very little on which they have built this edifice that convinced 81% of the people that were turned from creation to evolution. Uh, a greater part of the evidence for fossil man, because there's so little actual evidence, is from restorations. Now, if the, this critter were alive and we could see him walking around, this is the way he would look. Well, that, of course, would be impressive, but we don't have that. We have to restore it. And if you were to listen to programs like uh, CSI, some of the detective stories, you can find a little piece of uh, a skull and know what the whole thing looked like. Well, uh, that would be nice, and it makes good TV. But notice the statement by Ernst Hooten of Harvard, head of the anthropology department, or was at the time this was written. Uh, he says, to attempt to restore the soft, par soft parts is even more hazardous. You, you get hard parts, you got a little bit of it, and you try to restore the rest of the skeleton. That's bad enough. But the soft parts are even worse, and that's what gives the impression. The lips, the eyes, the ears, the nasal tip leave no clues on the underlying bony parts. Now, that's news to many, but it's a guess, and you're telling a story. And of course, what's going on is they assume that the story is true to start with, and then tell the story and then turn around and use that story based on the assumption to prove the assumption, which is obvious circular logic. He says you can with equal facility model on a Neanderthal skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. Now, I know what chimpanzees look like and uh, we've told the philosophers look like this back in Greece. Uh, I know some of them today. I think you can tell the difference, but from the same skull, you can model either, according to the head of the anthropology department at Harvard. Now, how powerful is the evidence then when you make it look like an ape? Uh, you see the problem. You're assuming the thing to be proved as you tell the story and then use the story to prove the point, and that's not valid science. Another part of the problem in dealing with fossil man involves the dating. Now, we talked about that earlier, and if you'd like to hear what we said that uh, there, you can go back and look at the archives. Um, but I can illustrate clearly some of the problems that are involved here when you're dating these old men, if you please, with an illustration from the 1470 skull. Uh, this is from the book Bones of Contention, written by Roger Lewin, who was editor of Research News. He's a good friend of Richard Leakey, who was the discoverer of the 1470 skull very important fossil man that we'll talk about later. And as they were concluding, and of course the, the, the whole ball game, of what, when did he live? He had to be at this point in order to fit in their lineup. And the calculated age was quickly refined to 2.61 plus or minus 0.26 million years. Uh, which two anthropologists unfamiliar with the procedures of radiometric dating has a ring of comforting precision about it. Now, if you're familiar, you know this is not something that you can really hang your hat on. It's, it, they're playing games. And he goes on to reveal that there's actually some deceit involved here. It sounds very precise. But he continues, and again, this is the friend of Richard Leakey. He is the editor of Research News Science, or was. He said there were 41 separate age determinations. Now, you don't see that in the textbooks. It's 2.6 million. 41 varied between 223 million and less than 1.91 million years. Now, that is a huge variation from 223 million down to less than one, but they sound very precise. Uh, after the first determination, they never again obtained 2.61, <laughs> but this huge range, well, they pick the one they want, and that's the one they print, and that's all you get to hear. Uh, this is not good science, and when you're dating old men, this is the kind of thing that goes on. We can see a more recent example of that from last year as they found um, two skulls, one uh, very obvious uh, modern human, the other very obvious Neanderthal, uh, reported here in 
Vizorg, actually it was uh, talking about an article from uh, Nature, uh, international team of researchers re-examined two skulls. One of them did, in belo did indeed belong to Neanderthal, but to the shock of the scientist, the skull named Aphidema I predated Aphidema II by as much as 40,000 years and was determined to be that of a Homo sapien. Now here you've got the Homo sapien 40,000 years later, uh, that is earlier, than the Neanderthal. It predated Homo sapien, uh, uh, Aphidemia II. Aphidemia I, the Neanderthal, was earlier. Well, now, that's, that's a mess. That's a shock <laughs> to the scientist. But they know how to fix that. Two days later in science, this explanation appeared. Uh, Warren Sharp, a uranium dating expert, University of California, Berkeley, points out that Aphidema I samples actually return dates ranging from more than 300,000 years to less than 40,000 years. Oh, well, you've got all of these extra dates. We didn't tell you about that to start with. <laughs> we, the one that was more reasonable, but now you've got all of these others. He said you have this huge spread of apparent ages and you don't know if any of them are good. Well, he's singing my song. This was the point I was making with the 1470 skull. Now then he makes it here where it suits his purposes. But these are the games that are played when you're dating old men. You've got a huge range, you pick the one you want, you're playing games with the dates, and this is not science. It ought to be an embarrassment to science, a huge spread. <laughs> you don't know if any of them are any good. Uh, you take your pick and claim that it's proved. Well, that uh, ought to be embarrassing. Let's also make this point before we begin to look at the specific examples. The basis of the conclusion when you're talking about evolution, how do you tell this one came from that one came from that one? Well, <laughs> you date and well, that's not really <laughs> that scientific as we've seen. The real key issue, according to Roger Lewin, is the ability to correctly infer a genetic relationship between two species. Is this one kin to this one? Th who, who is the descendant of whom? Uh, based on a similarity of appearance. And this is the ball game. Yeah, this one looks, but if you have this view of the lineage, it uh, looks differently often. But you subjectively evaluate the similarity. He said this is deceptive. This is his view. He says partly because the similarity of structure does not necessarily imply identical genetic heritage. And a lot of things are similar that are not kin at all. A shark, which is a fish, porpoise, which is a mammal, look similar. Uh, we, we see the porpoise and the uh, reptile, the ichthyosaur, neither of them are fish, ichthyosaur. Um, similarity doesn't prove that. So this is the key issue. This is the basis of how you do paleoanthropology and it's deceptive according to the evaluation of the editor of Research News. A very objective, <laughs> fair statement comes out of the mouth of Richard Lewontin of Harvard. He's being interviewed by Harper's. They just won a court case and he's <laughs> feeling confident. And I want to be fair, uh, he, he's got his guard down and he says some things he wouldn't perhaps normally say. He says, we don't know anything about the ancestors of the human species. Now, I, I want to be fair. To, to represent this correctly, we really have to emphasize the word no. As far as proof, scientific proof, you, you can't know. You dig people up in the graveyard, just look at the bones. You don't know who's kin to who. And certainly when you're talking about uh, supposedly millions of years. We don't know anything. No, that is scientific. All the fossils which have been dug up and are claimed to be ancestors, we haven't the faintest idea whether they're ancestors. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> and he will affirm dogmatically, but no, you can't. It's not scientifically proved. It's up to you to draw the lines, he says, uh, because there are no lines. 
bones. The dates are not stamped on the bones. There's no lines leading from this one to that one. As you see in the textbooks drawn by those who have assumed the thing to be proved to start with. This is the science of paleoanthropology. Another part of the problem involves the fact that they don't tell you the whole story. Now, we've seen this before. Lawyers who leave out facts uh, as they're trying to prove the point and they know facts that would affect the conclusion, they're going to be disbarred. This is not allowed, but it's allowed and practiced in science continually, and let me just justify that. This is the lineup. There are no lines, but they draw the lines, and this is the way they say it happened, and we'll be looking at each of these categories as we continue this study. Um, but beginning with Australopithecus at the bottom, leading up to modern man. Now, that looks pretty neat. It's similar to the logical fallacy that we illustrated when we were talking about fossils and similarities with the number of chromosomes. This kind of a lineup shows what appears to be the evolutionary progression from penicillium up to human. Yep, that looks like a progression until you look at the rest of the evidence and you see the amoeba has more chromosomes than we have. The turkey's got almost twice as many and the fern is up at the top. Opposite picture can be arranged when you select certain similarities. That's the kind of thing that we're looking at here. We're not seeing the whole picture. You recall I illustrated when we were talking about uh, salvation and what God says about what to do to be saved. We need the whole picture, and often you're only given part of it. David said the sum of God's word is truth. We look at this picture, uh, and well, who, what, everybody recognizes this, or do they? It's a, part of the old master's painting. Uh, well, maybe you can make a point about the nature of this painting, but let's look at the rest of the picture. And yeah, now I see more than when you just look at part of it. You can give a totally false impression when you just look at the picture, but just part of the picture. Likewise here. Here's Australopithecus at the bottom. He's about three feet tall, supposed to be three million years old, roughly. Um, much like a chimp, and very much like a chimp, as we'll see. But what they leave out is uh, revealed actually just last year, or at least they promoted it. It's, uh, <laughs> you've never seen this in the textbooks. Giant ape, directly linked to orangutan. He was almost 10 feet tall. Wow, uh, 1,300 pounds. Uh, now, where does he fit in the picture? Well, he was about 9 million years old, according to them, way older than this little bitty chimp that's supposed to lead to the bigger ones, but he's got the, he was there first, discovered back in 1935, and you've heard all about it? I don't think so. What you hear about is Australopithecus. Uh, you don't hear about Gigantopithecus, nine million years, uh, before the three million year old little chimp. Now, that's like the picture where you just look at a part that they want you to see. You look at the selected chromosomes, you don't look at the rest, of, and you get a completely false impression. Now, we want to look at each of these categories and we'll begin just briefly looking at Lucy, which is the first uh, rung of the ladder, Australopithecus, with Gigantopithecus, 10 feet tall before it that you don't hear about. This is the most famous representative. We won't have time to look at all of the evidence this morning. You'll have to tune in next Sunday morning to hear the rest of that, and we'll look at each of those on the rungs of the ladder supposedly leading to, leading to man. Lucy was discovered by Donald Johansson uh, a number of years ago, but many do not agree, especially at the time it was discovered when they looked at the evidence. Uh, Lord Sully Zuckerman, for example, is quoted in uh, Roger Lewin's Bones of Contention, saying, referring to the dismissal of Australopithecines as having anything to do 
with human evolution. They're just bloody apes, he says. The Australopithecine skull is in fact so overwhelmingly simian as opposed to human that the contrary proposition could be equated to the assertion that black is white. Now, that's a pretty flat-footed statement by one of the leading paleoanthropologists in Europe. Um, he refers to figure five to justify this very flat-footed statement, and I think we can see that it is justified. On the left, we see chimpanzee skulls. On the right, we see the Australopithecus skull. Mm, boy, they look just almost the same. The dentition is a little bit different, but the dentition of Australopithecus is almost identical to the Galata baboon, which is 100% ape. So there are apes that have teeth just like that, but boy, that looks not human. It looks very apish. And so when he says the contrary <laughs> proposition could be equated to the assertion that black is white, they're overwhelmingly simian. He's telling the truth. Now, there's much more evidence, but we'll just have to wind up at that point. We need to look at all of the evidence to understand the picture. Now, we've just given a preliminary introduction to the nature of the evidence of fossil man this morning. They've selected certain parts of it, left out parts of it. They play games with the dating. Uh, I think we need to be honest with the evidence. I want to know all of the facts. And we hope you'll tune in and be with us next week when we look at the rest of the evidence for fossil man. I think it supports our confident faith in our Creator. Thank you for being with us this morning.